This panel, it doesn't actually have any smarts in the individual LEDs. This is more like what you'd use to build a big video wall. The Hub 75E style 64 by 64 two millimeter pitch LED displays. We're using the power of a hardware description language, in this case an industry standard one called Verilog, to get a little bit of a shorthand in describing how data flows between registers, but we're still kind of defining the hardware in these modules that map pretty closely onto gates on the FPGA. This has enough circuitry to select one row of the display and display data on that row. And then you can just do that really quickly to scan through all the rows in the display. And then that scanning is what we're implementing on the FPGA, which is this board under all the clips here. Working with this board, we're working with this tool called Ice Studio. It's kind of a hybrid graphical and textual design tool. This is just a power cable for five volts for these level shifters over here. Two side-to-side -side PMOD connectors. Blank, zero clock, R, G, and B, two bits each. So with that two parallel rows on the PMOD, we've got the RGB data on one connector, and then address, blank latch, and clock on the other connector. This is 274, something rather, 245 buffers, which are being used as a level shifter. 132nd multiplexing instead of 116th, is that what's going on? Lots of people have written drivers for these LED panels, but I thought it'd be interesting just to try designing one of those from scratch. And I thought it'd be interesting to, instead of doing it in like pure Verilog, to do it with this Ice Studio thing, which is kind of a graphical designer that incorporates a node-based layout like you might be familiar with from something like Max MSP. It also has those nodes built using Verilog. Let's get the PLL started, actually. That's a, that's a good thing to do first. We want a clock at 30 megahertz, is that at the maximum that this supports? We can reach exactly 30 megahertz by multiplying that 12 megahertz clock up to 960 megahertz, dividing it back down to 30 megahertz. That's how PLLs work. They usually multiply up to a really high frequency and then divide it back down. This is a little bit like the Arduino IDE comes to FPGAs. It's intended to be kind of a single thing that you install, understands your board and understands IO and gives you a library of examples and documentation, basically graphical. And then within those graphical elements, you can have code. This maps to a specific, like a hard macro on the FPGA, like something that is not implemented in Verilog code, but is just like an external entity that we're referring to. And then these parameters end up getting compiled into the bitstream and turn on flags in the hardware that configure that kind of baked in module that is the phase locked loop. So we're just like choosing options. If you go to the data sheet for this FPGA, it'll explain what the options mean. All well, that compiled. So this LED on the right side is blinking. So then holding down this should increase the flash rate. Oh, sweet, and the PLL is locked. So let's say we want this to be clock 30. Can we now just take this and use it as a library component of some sort? So uh, my understanding here is that clock and latch are positive polarity. Output enable is negative polarity, but a lot of people just choose to write that as blank. So I think if you're writing it as blank, it would be positive logic. This is latched on the positive edge. So it needs the 30 megahertz clock. We're just gonna leave that as the only input for now. And then outputs will be RGB. Address. I was just momentarily thinking about whether to gate the clock or not. I mean, I could also imagine having the logic run it twice the, uh, the output rate, but it seems like an interesting exercise to try to have the logic run at the same rate as the output bus. What would happen if I just connected this clock directly to that clock, and we're just always clocking out at 30 megahertz? Would that work? Would that be a problem? I don't think that's actually what I want, because I think I do actually want to stop the clock while I'm latching. So I think I actually only want a pulse on S clock during clock cycles where we're actually clocking out a bit. Let's say I wanted to just clock out a single bit. So at some point that bit gets latched into some internal D flip flop, some data value is there. And let's say at the same time, we have like an enable signal that is synchronized with that data. We've got one clock cycles worth of data or data valid, I guess we would call this signal. 
These are some yet to be named internal signals which represent data that we want to clock out but is not quite there yet. And this would be kind of how it would line up to our internal clock. I could take this clock and end it with this signal. This edge here is always going to come after this edge by some small amount depending on the latency of the logic. So if you and these together that would still experience just a single edge transition. If this was high and then it's going low though I could see that being a problem. So can we like is that where we're going to see the issues on the other side of this? We've got a clean edge then we get a clean edge because this is the only signal that's changing. Then what happens over here? This clock goes high before valid goes low. So we actually get an edge, and then valid goes low after that signal finishes propagating. So then we get a glitch. That's what we need to avoid in clock gating. I just don't know if I can drive this same flip-flop from neg edge and pause edge. If this has support for DDR, it must, like double data rate works like this. So you can actually make an instance of the specific output circuit that the FPGA has. Usually that happens automatically, but if you do it manually, you can specify your own options. And you can see here, it actually has like five flip-flops in the schematic and some multiplexers. It's got a flip-flop for positive and for negative clock edges. Well, this will be either one if we're outputting a data bit or zero if we're not outputting a data bit and then zero regardless. Uh, that's better. This is useful for helping us time the data relative to the clock on each of those shift registers. The next sub problem to break this up into might be how to sequence the refresh. I think it makes sense to keep building timing kind of from the bottom up, like start at the SPI clock, figure out what the timing needs to be there and then build up until we get pixels. So I could actually see this module having like a next line signal maybe. And then when that next line signal is asserted, probably for just one clock cycle, that's what triggers whatever module is generating the pixels to start streaming pixels into this module. And then that next line signal could be synchronous with something that indicates which line we're talking about. We only need this to count 64 pixels, like six bits. By making this a seven bit counter, we can overflow and then use this other bit as an indication that we're done. Okay, this is where we can just kind of make something up. Like this is where we would be doing some PWM determinations. We'd be figuring out what actual pixel to put here. But for now, maybe I'm just gonna hook this up to the counter. Okay, so that's two of these little boxes so far. We've got the output latches. We've got this module, which currently isn't doing a lot except keeping track of horizontal pixels. That's where the RGB signals come from. All right, and then this is the place where we can put some timing generation. Okay, I think that's our state machine. Can we actually fit the whole thing on the screen? So next line begin should just pulse once. That top trace is gonna be blank by context and the next one, um, D9, is latch. So we are blanking it well before we actually do the latch now. It seems like we're enabling the output one clock cycle too early, and we're giving it an entire clock cycle at 30 megahertz for the blank to apply, and then for the LEDs to come back up in the new um, pattern. So I would expect that to be pretty resistant to ghosting artifacts. So we've got one little module that just does the clock gating, one module that's actually rendering the pixels right now as a complete stand-in, and then a state machine to generate the scanning timing. Stripey stuff. That's pretty much what I would expect. And the pattern you're seeing is just what happens if you if you send the horizontal coordinate as a, a binary number, you know, from zero to 63. If you send that directly into the input of the shift registers. This is the lower three bits, it's a three bit pattern. And then this is the top three bits. And so you're just seeing that same pattern, but spread out over groups of eight pixels. That's a megabit of SP RAM. Single port RAM, 16 bits wide. And this is dual port RAM if we wanted to use that. I'd be using pretty much all the embedded RAM on this chip if I wanted kind of my 18 bit per pixel double buffer situation. If I'm doing binary code modulation and not PWM, then I could have the advantage of only needing to fetch one bit from memory at a time. That would improve the hardware a lot. I mean, there's another idea where we do things line by line instead of frame by frame. I'm thinking let's use one of these RAM 2048s as a, uh, a single line. All right, so this is the placeholder for something that writes into RAM, which is not happening yet. Then the RAM needs to interface with this module to actually get the pixels out. Let's say that has the non-inverted frame toggle and the regular read address. So those are always operating on opposite halves of the memory. 
read address and another output which is read enable and then an input here which is the data that we've just read. Okay, so now I need to add some code to this module that can sequence the reads from the RAM and get the pixels out at the right time. PWM, the way I kind of had it here, would imply that you have access to the entire pixel value on every clock cycle here. But actually, I just have access to one bit per channel. So this really needs to be a bit plain number, not a PWM counter. And the idea is that we would march through each of those bits and allocate a different length of enable pulse to each of those bits with binary weighting. And these are organized such that these six bits that are in each column of this RAM are the six bits that we're sending out to the LEDs. So it's red, green, and blue for the bottom half, red, green, and blue for the top half, and that's it. I am writing the RAM once per line. I'm reading the RAM probably once per line per modulation step. Generate line begin. There are kind of two different things we might be waiting on. Either we might be waiting on the next 64 pixels to get shifted out, or we might be waiting for you know, the timer that tells us how long the enable should be on. We might be waiting for that to expire. It's like this moment here where we're unblanking, that is kind of the beginning of one of our timed cycles, the little kind of bit plane sized modulation cycles. Like here's where we might actually calculate the value, the reload value for the unblanked timer. Okay, so we always output a new line once we reach the, def reach the default state. If this is the first plane, then we also start generating a new line into the opposite buffer. And if it's not our first time through, if we hit this unblank enable, then we actually unblank the display and we set a timer so that we're simultaneously waiting for the line to clock out and waiting for the unblank timer. And we only proceed once both of those have finished. Yeah, let's just do this kind of straightforwardly. 16 bit shift plane. Uh, this is looking correct so far. I think we are correctly rendering a grayscale modulated black frame at the moment. Let's put some stuff in RAM maybe. All right, so this renders the pixels from RAM. This contains the RAM and handles addressing. That's the actual pixel output. And this is the clock gate control using the DDR style output. All right, that's a little less messy. This whole LED scan out block also might be worth splitting up into other blocks, but at least this kind of fits on a page, kind of. All right, this is starting to be a little more manageable again. So we've got our LED scanner in here. There was a question earlier about like, why are we using memory for this? We're going to be writing the pixels into memory in a different order than they're being read. So we're writing them one pixel at a time and then reading them one bit plane at a time. And so this is, in a sense, kind of a reordering buffer that lets us process each pixel once and then visit them all once per bit plane. This is kind of where we have to, to deal with the like, <laughs> turning the data 90 degrees. The memory here wants one bit each from six different pixels on each clock cycle. So another thing to do is to generate six pixels and then you have to go and stick those six values in memory. I feel like there's room for another high level module here, which is sort of like a shader controller kind of thing. Something that can ask another module to generate a pixel value at a particular coordinate and then stuff that pixel value into memory correctly. But let's try to do something simpler than that first. So like we're throwing away all the bits except for one on every clock cycle here. This is part of why we should be storing the value in the RAM and generating it once. Let's try doing a brightness ramp. So our X coordinate at this point is pixel and our Y coordinate is the combination of adder and whether we're forming RGB zero or RGB one. I think this will give us a gradient if I'm right. Oh yeah. I think we're off by one pixel on each axis, but otherwise that's pretty good. But yeah, the brightness control seems good. This is with basically eight bit color per channel, so 24 bit total. We load the shift registers and then we're still displaying LEDs because our timer hasn't expired. And then here we're loading the next pattern. This full width of the scope right now, that is one frame. The blanking on the display kind of has binary weights to it. You have a little blanking interval right here in the middle of the screen around the address transition. And then there's the first active period and then the longer active period and an even longer active period. 
you can see the least significant bit at 8, then the next bit at 9, then 10, 11, and the most significant bit at 15. So this should act like a dual port memory which will flexibly be sized according to these parameters. And this will be the line buffer. It doesn't really matter which address bit we use for the buffer toggle, so in this case we're using the least significant bit. What I want here is not just like a bunch of increasingly complicated modules, but I want to try to have a collection of simple modules that work together. So this needs the scan plane done out and begin in, and that comes from the scan controller, which is another piece we should be extracting. So these aren't necessarily parameters that correspond to the physical shape of the display. It's more like the logical, like electrical matrix layout. So it's the number of pixels on the shift register chain, the number of separate multiplexing steps that we need to do to refresh the whole display, and then the number of simultaneous lanes of output that we have. Minimum plane duration. All right, one thing that's useful to do, at least I find this useful when I'm writing state machines, is for every state, just think about what you want all the registers in the design doing. Just like treat that as a checklist and go through the registers, figure out what they should all do in each state. And that can be useful for sorting through a larger problem like this. So this is adapting sort of a regularized bus width, which is a little bit bigger than we actually need it to allow for some alternative uses. It's adapting that to the actual size that we have. If we wanted fewer bits of brightness control, but faster refresh, we could take this same design and change the number of planes, for example. We could also change the duration. We look at the output from synthesis to see how many block rams this turned into. It should be two or three. Two, great. And we're only using a little bit of the FPGA so far. So this is, this is totally just a stand-in, but what this fundamentally needs to do is it gets a signal when we're beginning the line, and it needs to effectively reset the state machine in here and have it start processing a new line. This is our shader module thing. Pretty wide X and Y buses and a wide RGB bus. Begin pixel is a strobe signal. It goes high for one clock cycle on the same cycle that X and Y are valid. And then pixel done goes high on the same cycle that the RGB output is valid for that same input. All right, so that's a thing that we could write as a shader kind of thing. So the next block is kind of the thing that goes in between this and the interface we have. So these were like LED refresh, LED line buff, line scan. I would like to have something which is about the memory state machine and something which is about the shape of the addressing. This is gonna stick the output into some temporary location either a really tiny RAM or some flip-flops. Like, this actually might need another little tiny RAM just to, like, turn the data 90 degrees. Well, we need to send the data out in this planar order, but we probably want to generate it one pixel at a time. And so this buffer up here, the line buff, this lets us generate the data and scan it at different speeds, and it lets us scan it multiple times and generate it once. It doesn't actually help us do that 90 degree rotation. We don't want to write what would be a single word, and then the next word, and then the next word. We want to write, like, the least significant bit on a bunch of words, and then the next bit on a bunch of words, etc. The state machine would need to iterate over probably first the pixel and then the lane. Just do those in order. It would need to collect all the pixels for all the lanes and then write those to RAM in a different order. 